Uh, hey everyone, welcome. Thanks a lot for coming to this talk. My name is Yuka Chen. I'm a software engineer at Pinterest and I work on the big data workflow platform team. Today, together with my teammate Ace, we are going to share how we improve the airflow system usability at Pinterest for our users. And we want to share our experience with the hope that the work we have done here could potentially benefit your work at your organization in some way. And we'd like to get feedback from you as well. A little bit about Pinterest. Pinterest is a visual discovery engine. It's a positive corner on the internet. Our mission is to bring everyone the inspiration to create a life they love. Pinterest runs on data, and our data infrastructure has a large footprint. Our team builds a workflow system where all the Pinterest data jobs and pipelines run on it. Internally, our system is called Spinner and is built on top of Airflow. Also, we had been going through a migration process from the old system to Spinner last year. If you are interested in how we did the migration, back on Monday, our team gave another talk about the Pinterest migration journey. You may want to take a look at the recording of that talk later. So now coming back to Spinner workflow system, Today, we have more than 13,000 active users. That's about a half of the whole Pinterest engineering. And each day, there are over 12,000 DAG runs, close to 80,000 task instances, and over 80,000 UI and API requests. That's the scale we operate on. And we treat our workflow system as a product, serving customers globally. Although our users are only the internal users, they do have a wide range with all types of backgrounds. Our users include engineers and also have non-technical people like the legal and the marketing team and analysts. Those users may have different needs and requirements. So for us, providing a delightful user experience and boosting pr developer productivity is very important. While we build an operate spinner, what we do is we constantly collect feedback from our, our users we listen to them and gather their pinpoints. Because we want to make sure what we are working on, the most important things our users need, and make sure the features we build and the things we add into the system help our users to better accomplish their work, bring success to them. And how do we identify what our users want? In order to identify what our users want, we collect feedbacks by having company-wide surveys, which usually runs every half year. And we also do the platform-specific surveys through training sessions. And we provide the tools for users to raise their voice, send their requests, and having votes on it. And weekly as a meeting, we process those user requests once they hit some cutoff we define. So for example, if a request has more than five or 10 votes, we will turn that into an action item. By repeating such a process, we make sure the requirements are impact, impactful and the worth building can be prioritized. And one thing to mention is we do align the features we want to build with our team's long-term roadmap and OKRs. That's another perspective. So starting from here, next, we are going to show you some of the usability enhancements and the features we have recently built into the, our Airflow-based system to meet our customer needs. And we are going to look at the tooling for improving the debuggability, the tooling for backfilling back runs, and a handful of other usability features. In the end, we will discuss our future plans, especially the open source considerations. Why don't we start from the debugging tooling? So Spinner debugging tooling is a project that we started from the beginning of this year, 2021. And the goal is to provide tooling for our users and enable self-service troubleshooting. For many of the workflow users, one thing on top of their mind every day is one question. Are my decks running well? Do I need to worry about it? A user may come to Spinner and see their dive run took more than five hours, and they may want to find out why it seems to be longer than Euro. And another user may come to Spinner and see their task fails, 
and want to figure out what caused that failure. So in the past, the way we support users for troubleshooting is mainly by using the Slack channel and the user will come to the channel and ask for help. However, this support model is apparently not quite scalable. As the number of users grows, the support load becomes higher and it has become a burden to our team. Also from the user's perspective, this, their experience is not good because the turnaround time for getting their questions answered or problems resolved could become longer too. Uh, we realized such a problem and came up with the idea of building the debugging tooling to enable self-service troubleshooting. The top three problems we want to solve by the debugging tooling are the following. Firstly, how can we help users to analyze the workflow delays, finding the slow paths and the tasks in a dev run? And secondly, how can we help users to understand their task is running at which stage for how long time? So we know in the out-of-box airflow, users can see the task instance in different states, such as uh, queued, scheduled, running, failed, or success, up for retry, etc. cetera. Uh, in our case at uh, Pinterest, the workflows are orchestrated by Spinner, while the task instance running process may have dependencies on the other third-party compute platforms. So some examples are the Kubernetes, Hadoop, Spark SQL platforms operated by the other teams. While a task instance runs, it may encounter different issues related to those third-party platforms. So given that, it is helpful to have insights into the task execution process with finer granularity. That's the second problem. And the third problem is how can we help users to easily figure out the root cause when their task fails? So our solution to these problems are the critical path finder, task execution stager, and the failure error analyzer. The critical path finder is a feature that helps users to analyze their workflow delays by identifying the slowest pathways in a deck run. And in this feature, we calculate and visualize the critical paths in a run. And the way we do the calculation is by tra traversing all the paths in a dagger run based on DFS. And we also show the duration time of the slow paths and the task on the UI and analyze the historical duration time of a specific task, try to provide more insights. And otherwise, the time that can be possibly improved for the slow tasks. And we added this feature in the deck graph view by adding a checkbox on the right side. So when this show critical path is selected, the slow paths and the tasks will be highlighted in the graph view. So one thing to be noticed here is there can be more than one critical path in a one deck run. Also the duration time will be displayed on those edges. And there's also an animation to visualize the task and that takes the longest time to complete in the whole pass. Once the slow pass and the task are found, the users might want to further understand the duration of specific tasks. So what they can do here is clicking on the task node. Then they will see a task duration analysis pop up with more detailed information. So here in this duration analysis, we aggregate the historical duration time data for each task, calculate the mean, max, and the average, and also show a comparison between the duration of the current run and the average duration. So with this, the users can get an idea about whether this run takes longer than euro or not. And they can also see how many tries this run heights and easily navigate to the task log view from here. So one thing to mention here is that we have a plan to enhance this task duration analysis to show the trend of the recent uh, duration time. By doing that, we could help users to have a better understanding of the duration time changes and if there's anything they may need to investigate. So here's a quick demo 
of the critical pathfinder, and I want you to see how it works in action. So now we are in the graph view, and uh, the critical path is selected. Then the paths and the tasks are highlighted, and also the timing is showing on the edges. Now we can see the duration analysis. And um, if we unselect it, it will go back to the normal deck view. All right. So now let's jump into another feature we created as part of the debugging tooling, and that's the task execution stager. The goal here is to provide visibility into the task execution process with finer granularity. So as mentioned earlier, when a task instance is running, it may have dependencies on multiple third-party compute platforms. And there could be different issues happening on those third-party platforms. So this task execution stage will be able to help users to understand the status and timing when your task runs into the different stages. This feature also comes with the failure error analyzer to analyze the task logs and find the root cause when a task fails. On the UI, the task execution stage is added in a task log view. For each task try, we show such a pipeline to visualize the stages and the task run has been going through. And the stage with support include the built-in stages, such as when the task instance is in a scheduler in the executor process. And we also support other customized stages. For example, this prepared pod in Kubernetes means the, when the task is starting the pod in Kubernetes, and the GSS execution, which denotes the task runs on our internal Hadoop or Spark platform. The duration time of each stage is shown on the edges, and you may have noticed the length of those edges are changing proportionally to the duration time. Uh, if hovering over each node, you can see the time when this task instance enters this stage, exits this stage, exiting status, and there can be more meta info. So if a task fails, what will happen? So if the task fails, this execution stage will evoke the failure error analyzer to find the failure root cause. A field stage is displayed in the red color. And when hovering over the stage node, you will see the root cause analysis result, including the error category, error messages, and where you can get help from the Slack channel if you need more assistance. Lastly, let's look at a quick demo for this stage tool. So now in this task try, it succeeded, so everything is green. And in the try four, it fails in the GSX job stage. So we can see the timing information when hovering over uh, the task node. Now is a good time for us to take a step back and look at from the high level how this task execution stage is implemented. This feature contains many five components. Aside from the UI component we have just seen, the other components are, the first one is the execution stages, which are the Python classes for predefined stages. The second one is the stage tracker, which initializes the stage objects for a task instance. And once the task instance runs, it emits the stage change events and evoke the failure analysis process if ever the failure, uh, the fail happens. And the third component is the error analyzer, which currently uses a rule-based classifier to categorize the errors in a task log and uh, identify the failure cause. The fourth stage uh, component is the stage loader. This one abstracts the stage objects and provides a read-only access to the task stage information. It's a handy interface where the 
API and the UI can read staged data from. So with that, let's jump into another feature we built for improving debuggability, and that is the DAC parsing error feature. We have thousands of the user DACs, including the native DACs and those migrated from the old system. And it happens that some of those DACs, especially the dynamic DACs, encounter errors when they are being parsed during the scheduling process. These errors can be seen in the system logs, but the problem is our users don't have access to those system logs. So with this feature, we want to expose the DAC processing errors to end users and ease their debugging process. In the DAC view, we added a new tab for the DAC parsing error. And in this tab, we show users detailed and concise information about errors and stack traces. It also shows the time when the errors are detected and the execution date of this DAC run. So sometimes the same error can be detected for multiple times. And, and when that happens, we are not showing multiple records in the table. Instead, we only show one record with the last updated timestamp. So in order to make this feature more discoverable, we show this warning in the DAG view once the parsing error is detected. And in this warning, there's a link to the error tab. Also, sometimes a user stack could have a common issue so that multiple DAG runs into a particular passing error. So in order to help users uh, find out those stacks more efficiently, we enhance the search function in the DAG list view to support searching DAG errors with this dropdown. So far, we have looked at the critical path finder for analyzing workflow delays. And we looked at the execution stager with the failure analyzer, which provides more insight into the execution process. And we also look at the DAG parsing error feature. So that has covered a good portion of the debugging tooling. Now I'm handing over to Ace to continue this talk, touching on the other areas. Thank you so much, Yukis, for sharing out that. Uh, once again, my name is Ace. I'm also on the workflow platform team here at Pinterest. Uh, and so uh, we'll start off by talking about the back post submission tooling that we've built. Sorry about that. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and talk about some of the back post submission tooling that we built. Uh, so just to recap, our high-level goal is to provide an isolated, dedicated, scalable, and reliable way for users to rerun uh, any workflow for past dates. Uh, as Yukis mentioned, we had a session earlier uh, in the week uh, discussing how we also support a migrated case. So this is to support migrated cases and native cases. Uh, just to go over some of the requirements. So what we need to support our users successfully is to have separate concurrency controls between production and for backfilling. We need to support having a stateless component in some shape or form, uh, which means that if the backfill job dies, we need to be able to bring it back and resume from where it left off. Uh, we need to provide tooling such as killing backfills if need be. Uh, we want to make sure that users can only backfill DAGs that they have edit access to. Uh, we want to make sure that we log anytime a user submits a backfill as it is triggering uh, live production data runs. And we want to be able to support scaling this up and down. Doesn't matter if uh, the backfill is just for a single day or for a year. Uh, all those uh, cases need to be self contained in our solution. Without jumping into too much detail, we just wanted to talk about the design a little bit. So we did initially build a V1 version of our backfill that was just built on top of the scheduler job uh, to kind of levy some of the uh, great features that the scheduler job has uh, self-contained, such as uh, being able to clear a task, being able to uh, handle running it. Uh, but there are obviously lots of holes there, um, such as being able to separate out uh, concurrency controls, uh, having the issues with dependency management, such as um, uh, if we try to run a date uh, beyond the start date, obviously the scheduler doesn't like that, or if the DAG is parsed, 
Um, it also doesn't like that. Uh, it also had some issues with our migrated DAG model. Uh, so once again, we just thought we build uh, a new solution, uh, which we call Backfill 2.0. And the general flow is that we have a form for the user to fill out. So we have this multi-tenant system and users all go to this form, fill out the information they need uh, to submit a backfill. We create a, a submission table, which uh, records any kind of submission any user sends along with all the metadata associated with it. Uh, we then invoke a, a backfill scheduler DAG, which is a component we built to reuse some of the infra we already had. Uh, and that backfill scheduler DAG is essentially an orchestrator for handling any sort of backfill submission. So what is uh, one backfill submission DAG exists for every single submission, uh, and it starts its own Kubernetes executor, which then goes on to generate all the pods it needs to run each task and maintain the entire lifecycle of the backfill, um, letting us know if it succeeded completely uh, successfully or if it failed. So just to share some quick snapshots of what the form looks like, uh, our general form has a bit of information it needs to collect from the users. Uh, to be honest, you could get away with just passing the DAG, uh, the start date and end date, and there you go, you have a backfill submission. But this form also supports more advanced cases. For instance, if you only want to submit uh, some set, subset of tasks, you could go ahead and do so. Uh, we made some modifications in the code and the sub DAG uh, commands to be able to uh, handle that case. We also support the major uh, different options that the backfill job supports, such as rerunning in the past or ignoring uh, the uh, past dates even. Um, also just marking things as success, uh, clearing the previous records. So we support all of those cases and we have a few other options, such as uh, some specific uh, Hadoop team settings that uh, get attributed to all of their different jobs. And finally, uh, at Pinterest, generally, anytime these kinds of things occur, we usually log some kind of JIRA ticket uh, to just keep track of backfilling data or doing any sort of user command. So we provide a way for users to input that and we'll discuss later where uh, we can see all of these notes being captured. Just beneath uh, where a user can fill out the form, we also show the past submission. So the historical submissions for each user. So what this entails is uh, it basically shows the data that we store in the backfill submission table. So it'll show things like the start time and end time for the backfill submission, the DAG that was uh, to be submitted for, the start and end dates that they wanted the backfill for, if any subset of tasks were selected, the state, the progress between the DAG runs uh, a part of the backfill, as well as some sort of highlighting for any options that were selected. And a users can take action on this form, I'm sorry, uh, and what I want to show is that in this final column, we do have an option to kill a backfill. We'll discuss this a little bit further in a future slide, but this is where a user can take those actions as well as any admin member. So this GIF is just to kind of show the process. So you see a user selects the DAG from the dropdown. Uh, they're just running for, to, for the date that's set. Uh, by default, the backfill date is set to yesterday. Uh, then once the user confirms, you'll get this modal pop-up discussing some of the concurrencies uh, that are associated with the backfill, uh, just making sure that the user is aware of the resources that the backfill will require and making sure that they're aware of how long it may take. Um, so we put that onus on the user um, and we'll jump into each of these sections in a little bit more detail right now. But just to pinpoint one more thing is that we have this full history of all the backfill runs in a different view. Uh, it's very similar to kind of the DAG run and task instance views uh, where uh, they reside under the, the browse section, but we display all the same information as shown previous, but this is for the whole system. So a user could go and see, hey, did somebody else send, uh, submit a backfill for the same DAG as me? Uh, or uh, what kind of decks have been backfilled lately, how many, things of that sort. So it's especially helpful to the admin team, but also to our users. 
And just to make it very easy to get from one view to another, we provided in a graph view, if it is a backfilled uh, execution record, then we do show the backfill schedulers and the states that were associated with the backfills, just to share that. It's in the graph view, but it's also going to be in a log view, which we'll see uh, in a little bit. So talking about concurrencies again, this is actually a very important feature for us because uh, different workflows have different SLOs for production, but for the backfill case, we do not guarantee those same SLOs. First of all, uh, like you just mentioned, a lot of the heavy lifting is done by the uh, Hadoop team or Spark team and their clusters. So the, the concurrencies that they select here are really important to make sure that they're getting the right resources. So we provide a way for our users to even override the resources instead of having to make a code change. Uh, it's an internally managed system in Pinterest to basically have a KV store. Uh, so we display the, the values that the user will get for the backfill, but we also display in the DAG details kind of the active runs for the backfills uh, and the concurrencies settings there, just so they're aware if the user comes and says, hey, how come my backfill is taking so long? Well, we could just point to this. Um, and as well, before a user actually confirms a backfill, we do let them know the request, how many uh, task instances will be generated, how many backfills, how many, uh, or sorry, how many DAG runs, uh, things of that nature. And we tell them what the concurrency limits are according to the settings that will be provided to their DAGs. Um, and we kind of give them a recommendation. Is it sufficient? Maybe, you know, maybe not. So. Uh, it's really for the user to think a little bit. And in the future iteration, we would like to automate some of these uh, concurrency settings, uh, but it turns out to be a bit more complicated problem than uh, our V2.0 was uh, designed for. So talking about uh, the actions that users can take on backfills, obviously they can submit the backfill, but they also can kill backfills. And you may be wondering, hey, why does the user really need to kill a backfill? Well, one reason could just be that a uh, user accidentally submitted for extra dates um, and they didn't actually need to. Or maybe somebody uh, locally went and changed data and they don't need the backfill anymore. But even more importantly, it could be that, uh, again, uh, our backfill resources are shared for us and as well as our third party systems, um, whether it's Hadoop, Spark, et cetera. And uh, they may advise us that, hey, some of these backfills are not uh, for high tier or high importance workflows. Can we please kill them for now so that we can make sure that the important workflows uh, go ahead and uh, run as quickly as possible. So then we'll go ahead here. And there's two options for killing. You could actually either kill the actively running tasks currently or uh, and or or you could actually kill the scheduled tasks that would be scheduled as part of this backfill altogether. So if you click both options, everything gets killed, running and future. But you have the option to select either or in case you have a reason to. So that is a high level kind of recap of what our backfill form is, uh, why we built it and how it helps our users. Uh, next thing I want to do is kind of talk a little bit more about some of the usability features that we have. Uh, and each component here, I want you to uh, realize uh, they came from user requests. So uh, some of them uh, attribute to things that we had in our previous system that uh, deemed that they were very useful for our users. Uh, some of them actually arose as users interacted with the web server. The, the Achilles heel of uh, our Airflow cluster right now is that it has so many features that it's so great, but also sometimes has too many features that's hard for users to navigate. So uh, we'll go ahead and jump into it. So the way that most of the time users get notified is of course they have their workflow uh, and then they go ahead and set up their pager duties and their personal emails to get notified of any, any kind of failure or delay or any kind of issue altogether. So a lot of times the users will get these emails to their pager duties and it'll look something like this for a task. They'll say, hey, this is failed. These are the last 50 lines of the log that uh, maybe it could quickly help the user understand why it failed, uh, but sometimes it can't and the user needs to jump into it more. 
We also create a DAG level summary email. This is a successful case. Um, and these emails get sent to, again, the page duties and the personal emails. So we create a lot of clickable links. So it takes them directly to the next view that takes them to uh, something like the, the graph view. So the graph view here, so after the user sees these errors, they click on some of the links, it takes them to the graph view here. You see right below the actual uh, graph representation, we have added a table representation, which is a summary of all the tasks. Uh, the links of the, the names will take you to the logs, uh, the states, the start date, end date, durations, the number of tries. And one thing that's really useful to our users is uh, links to external systems. So a lot of times these are links to the Hadoop system or different Kubernetes uh, um, uh, exploration links, things of that sort. And so this is something that we built directly into the graph view um, just to have an eye view. And while it's true that if you hover over any of these tasks, uh, you will get some of the same information. It just uh, reduces the burden of having to take those extra steps. So if you click on those external links as shown in the previous slide, it will take them to something like Dr. Elephant, for example, or it will take them to uh, directly to the Monarch link to the Hadoop uh, application master, things of that sort. But we show this again in the log view here. So we have the Monarch links easily accessible here. So the user doesn't have to go through the logs, try to decipher, hey, where is the URL that I need to go to to understand a bit further why I had a failure. Um, and of course, if this was a backfill, we do add the backfill uh, scheduler information here too. So as the user continues to navigate, they'll go from the backfill view. Another thing that we show in that same log view is built information. So the two most common cases of failures for us are one, they're due to some application failure and external system, maybe the input data size change, anything of that sort. But secondly, uh, if you watched our first talk, we have multiple projects being managed for this whole spinner system. Uh, one of it is our Airflow fork code. Another is our uh, for native applications and our plugins. And lastly is our uh, Pinterest wide monorepo um, that serves mostly our migrated case. But outside of that, it also has a lot of utility functions that uh, organizations, you know, teams and organizations have built for quite some time that they want to still be able to access. So when any DAG runs, whether it's uh, even if it's native, it needs to have a certain version of each of those to be able to actually run how the user expects. So sometimes there may be this uh, um, discontinuity between the, the versions that are actually deployed versus what the user is expecting from their local setup. And this information here will let us know what are the actual uh, uh, latest commits that ran with this uh, with this actual run. And we could see, was your commit uh, basically part of this? And so it answers that question for them there too. And it's really important, once again, that all this information is contained in the log view, just because that's where the user is really going through to figure out what actions they need to take in order to resolve their issues. So talking about actions, the next slide is about these quick actions that you can help bring into the log view. And uh, uh, one common complaint that we got is once a user is going through the logs, figuring out, hey, this is what I need to do. Maybe it's as simple as rerunning. Uh, they don't want to go all the way back to the graph view or tree view to clear the task just for it to rerun again. They want to take that action right there. And so this uh, provides a way for these users to take those actions, whether it's marking it as success or failed because they handled something offline or just clearing it for the scheduler to, to rerun it. Similarly, uh, there are times, which this GIF will demonstrate, that uh, some workflows have multiple different branches that have tasks uh, being filled due to maybe some platform issue. Maybe they had three different uh, Spark applications that are unrelated, but all on different branches all failed. So uh, one of the common cases that a user just wants to clear all the failed runs uh, with a single click. They don't want to have to go through each branch and basically clear it. So in the tree view, it made kind of sense for us uh, at the DAG level to add this clear failed button, which will rerun all the different failed tasks uh, within this DAG run. 
And one of the great things, again, that I want to mention, we mentioned the backfill form, but also uh, as part of uh, taking actions for users in general, we want to provide a way for users to annotate why they're doing something. So you see if a user tries to clear or mark a success in that example, clear here, we want users to be able to annotate, hey, I cleared this or I marked this success because I handled it on this date. Here's the JIRA associated with this work. And this really allows us to keep track of why actions were taken. Of course, we audit, uh, we add this to the audit log, who did this action uh, and the notes. So it's a very clear representation of what the entire uh, life cycle of the user interaction, what their workflow is. And speaking of logging, so now we're talking about the audit log. So while, uh, while Airflow out of the box has the huge log table and a lot of things get log, uh, our scale is quite high at over 75,000 to 80,000 runs, um, task instance runs daily. Uh, so this makes a lot of noise in our current version of this logging. So we've added some classes and uh, just to put the, the actions that we really do care about and a lot of those actions reside in what a user does through the UI. It might be um, unpausing a DAG, it might be taking an action such as clear or failed or deleting. Those are the things that really do matter to us versus the system generated audit logs uh, of when the uh, local task executor is running. And so uh, we help build this DAG audit log here, which is for each DAG, we get to see all the logs attributed with it. Um, uh, if you can see in this comment, anything that had a comment associated with it, we do highlight so that it clearly should, uh, demonstrates why the user took that action as well. So we'll see some of these as clear uh, and things of that sort. So that is generally, um, I wanna take a quick brief pause there. That generally kind of encapsulates end-to-end uh, -end the user's flow from when they're going from getting an alert all the way to what they want to maybe see and take action to resolve their issues. Uh, but some other kind of features that the users have asked for is, uh, one of it is just a summary of the DAG run. So Airflow out of the box does a really a superb job to kind of display all this information about task instances. So we get the, uh, uh, the Gantt view, uh, the landing times, the uh, kind of run times history even. Uh, but we don't have that same information for the DAG runs. And for us, we as an organization set a lot of SLOs on the entire DAG run. And while we do have on the tasks, we want to see both. It helps us observe what kind of anomalies happen, you know, run to run, day to day. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry. So continuing on that, here we see that we create this DAG run history tab view. And uh, we just basically add all the same information from the DAG run table of start date, end date, durations, and what kind of runs it was as long, along with the state. And very similarly in this next slide, we get to see that we also show this history view and the same DAG uh, duration history view where the task live right under it, we show one for the entire DAG run. So we could see on different dates, why, uh, what were the anomalies, uh, the outliers, uh, maybe we need to investigate further what happened that day. Even for us as a platform, we want to capture some of this information to realize, is it something that's going on in our executors or Kubernetes clusters? Do we have a large scheduling delay? What is it? Or is it just uh, accumulation of the tasks taking longer because of an external problem? So these are the kind of questions that we try to solve um, as well as kind of uh, notify our users of the same kind of information. Uh, one of the last features I want to talk about before we get to Q&A is that uh, this one is really cool. It's uh, called a workflow incident manager, and uh, it tries to answer questions that usually happen for us. So a user or a bunch of users will come to our workflow channel and be like, hey, I've had a few workflow jobs suddenly start to fail today. I've had no changes recently. Is there something wrong with the uh, Spinner platform? which is our Airflow platform or any other thing. And so we provide this really great way to show this attention to our users. We want to basically uh, capture if anything is going wrong in the company for other systems or uh, other processes and to help display, hey, this is what's going on. This may be affecting your, your workflows. 
uh, please follow this uh, kind of channel or ticket to, to see what's happening. And we personally go through and update this to keep our users informed of uh, what's happening. But beyond just the incidents, so internally we call it incidents in Pinterest where anytime there's a problem with any system, it gets brought up. Um, there's also other cases that we want to use this, such as sharing uh, if a code freeze is coming up, you know, for the holidays. If uh, at times if you have scheduled maintenance, some organizations may have that. This is a perfect way to illustrate that to users. And sometimes you could even use this maybe to share a, a new feature if you'd like. Um, and so there's a lot of different use cases that maybe other organizations want to take advantage of. But for us, we mostly use it to just find a way to keep informed our users because our users uh, do go through the web server most of the time to, to do any sort of action. So it's the best place to inform them. And lastly, just to kind of uh, reiterate, the admin side of that same workflow into the manager, uh, we have a form that we fill out through the UI as well, and we pass information such as what the issue is, a description, what the severity of it is, uh, when it started, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and we also have a way to, dis, uh, to say what clusters it affects. Sometimes you may have something that only affects PII data, and so the, only the PII cluster gets affected. And so, we, of course, we also keep records of all of those things that we have submitted in the past, and here it is. Uh, and lastly, uh, some additional things that we have that we found really helpful for our users is having like a single script for users to build up a uh, container to do their own testing locally. Uh, we also reduce our burden um, in reviews and uh, basically empower our users by building this kind of um, really collaborative and informative unit testing suite. So we want to run all these tests on the, on the um, submissions just to make sure that they can feel confident and we can feel confident that those changes are indeed passing our test and will be fine on the production cluster. So these are a few of the kind of features that we built. Uh, again, this kind of came up while we were trying to empower our users. Um, so given that, Last year, uh, at the beginning or end of 2019, beginning of 2020, uh, we really set out to first handle our migrations, but also come back and see, can we contribute to uh, the open source community while we're building this? Uh, of course, uh, Velocity was uh, very much basically a, a point of um, concern. Uh, so we needed to move fast and really get these migration efforts done. And so last year we didn't get to do it, but this year, we have roadmaps in Q3 and Q4 to talk more about open sourcing. Uh, and this is where we can really use your help. So for whoever's online, uh, it would be really great if you're part of this uh, cast right now or in the Slack channel or however, if you want, email me or, or you know, however you need to. Just let us know what are the things that your organization would most benefit from. You know, would it be uh, the critical pathfinder? If so, please put a number one. If it's something as simple as the dagger on history view, put number seven. We do have goals to maybe get all of these things out, but obviously that's difficult. Uh, and hearing from you will let us know what things maybe matter the most to your organizations that will help empower your users. Um, so thank you so much for listening today. Um, again, my name is Ace, uh, and thank you so much, Yukis, for helping present this information. Uh, here's our personal information if you ever want to reach out, talk about anything, uh, and discuss Airflow further. Uh, we're really excited about it. Uh, so thank you all.